we're going to go ahead and get started. Stand if you wish and sing with us when we all get to heaven.
Well, good morning to each and every one of you here this morning. Glad to see you in the in God's house. And God speaks to our hearts. He already has by special music. And we appreciate that. By uh, way of announcements, we have a few birthdays coming up. Um, Nathan, our son, has a birthday tomorrow, and Shirley has a birthday on Wednesday. So, uh, happy birthday to Shirley. Uh, Troy and Laura Poole celebrating an anniversary also on Wednesday. So, happy anniversary um, to you. Uh, Nadine and Teresa and grandson Joshua all have a birthday on Friday. So. Thursday is National Day of Prayer, certainly a day to be praying for our nation. Although other prayer requests, prayer concerns, or words of praise this morning? Yes. Continue prayers for, um, what's her name? Denise? Yeah. Okay. She's getting better. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's still weak. Thank <laughs> you.
uh, you pondered on them and thought about them, and hopefully we can um, deal a little closer with that. We find ourselves in Galatians 4, verses 1 through 17, but I want to share with you, after those three questions that we asked, is the law dead? Should it remain in order for us to keep God happy? And can we sin like crazy? Romans 7, 4 says, My brothers and sisters, you also die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. It says in the beginning of that verse, So my brothers and sisters, you also die to the law. Which really, in essence, answers that first question, is the law dead? Yes, it's dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this word. And Father, as even as today, we know the challenge back then uh, in the early church was the, the debate of the law and faith and grace. And Father, even today, we can we can be challenged and go back and forth. So Father, uh, Father, nobody needs to hear from me today. But Lord, I just pray that the Holy Spirit um, will share with us and guide us and direct us. I pray now, Lord, that I may decrease, that you may increase in Jesus' name. Amen. So, do we now proclaim as Christians that we can do what we want because we are not under the law but under grace? Now stay with me on this. The answer is yes. We're not under the law. You do need to know that how grace and being a Christian works. It will not change the yes answer to the question, but it will provide a better understanding <coughs> of the answer. The Jerusalem Jews, and if you've been here the last couple of weeks, you know this, was teaching that the law was necessary, a necessary add-on to faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, you needed the faith in Jesus Christ, but as an add-on to that, you have to understand the laws of what God says we can do and we can't do. So you take the faith, you take the grace that is justification that is given to us by the blood of Jesus Christ and then you have to take the law and sort of intermingle it a little bit because there's got to be guidelines, right? There's got to be do's and don'ts. So you have to take, and this was what the, uh, some of the Jews were presenting, you've got to intermix that. And you do that uh, <laughs> so that you can find favor in God. So this morning, we find ourselves in Galatians 4, 1 through 7, looking at the right time. So Galatians 4, 1 through 7 reads this, What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, the heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. What does that say? Paul's attempting again to get the understanding of the law and understanding of grace and salvation. Again, the first thing is the right step. And let me read again Galatians 4, 1 through 3. What I'm saying is that as long as you as as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave. 
although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, we were under age, we were in slavery under the elementary spiritual forces of this world. The guardianship of God's people prior to the coming of Christ was the Mosaic Law. It is when they were spiritual children. Let me, let me read what I wrote down here. Let me show you the implications of this. As long as the heir is a minor. When I think of heir, I think of Britain, right? And I did write down the, the kids' names. It always shows, um, and I'm sorry, I don't even remember any of their names, but... Um, um, One of the children is the heir to the throne. And I always think about I, I think it's still, that's neat because you see him up knee high to a duck and they're running around. That's the heir to the kingdom. <laughs> so that's when I think about that heir. So, um, but as heir is a minor, he has no advantage over the slave. <coughs> Though legally he owns the entire inheritance. He is subject to the tutors and the administration until whatever date the father has set for the minor's liberation. This is the way it is with us. When we were minors, we were just like slaves in a sense, ordered around by simple instructions, um, the tutors and administrators of this world with no say in the comfort of our own lives. You know, when you were a child, you were um, kids, or you told when to get up, you told when to go to sleep, you told what to wear, you told this is where you're going, and um, you really didn't have a time to um, to choose your own decisions in life. It was always chosen for you until you became an adult. Under the law. The Mosaic Law, it would tell them how to act and to live. Now, have you ever, I remember my, I just remember in my life people saying, oh, I tell you what, I'm going to lay down the law for them. This is what I expected, this is what you got to do, you got to do this, so I'm just laying down the law. And that was not a pleasant thought, right? When you say, well, what happened when you went to that meeting? What? Oh, they laid down the law, so there was no debate. I didn't get to um, didn't get to give back to them what my thoughts were. It was just simply the laying down of the law. And until Jesus Christ came, the the Jewish community followed the Mosaic law. It was the do's and the don'ts. The rabbinic tradition would say, here are the rules you must follow. If you do not follow them, God will not respect you like you. Well, we know that's not the truth, right? We know that Jesus loves us. There's nothing you and I can do to make him love you any less. But also, there's nothing you and I can do to make him love you any more. He loves you the same. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, educated at Oxford University. He did some wonderful work. And if you read about John Wesley, um, he went to prisons. He gave to the poor. He at one time was a missionary to the native Indians in America in the British colony of Georgia. After returning on the trip to Great Britain, Wesley wrote this. I who went to America to convert others was never myself converted to God. I had the faith of a servant, but I did not have the faith of a son. It was a short time after that he spoke of being forgiven by God for his sin. He lived under the law and he lived a exemplary life. I mean, talk about following the laws. He was 
I believe, checking almost every single box and not messing up. But even John Wesley, the great John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, said, by the law, I was covered. But I would never become, I had not become a son of God. In verse 3, it mentions the elementary spiritual forces of the world and that elemental means a list. Again, referencing, Paul is saying, setting up this illustration that at the time it was just as if a child, maybe an heir of a fortune, but he is a child under the guidance and the, and the, the teaching of others. So the same thing we want to look at is the right time. Verse 4 says, But when the, the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, I do not know if God has a calendar. Probably not. But if he does have a calendar, the day that Jesus was to come to earth had to be marked on his calendar. It was the exact time, it was the right time for Jesus to come into the world. I was looking at my calendar this week, and as usual, I talk about it all the time. As you get older, your calendar has more doctor's appointments than anything else. Well, I had it all set up. Wednesday, this doctor. Friday, this doctor. Well, I get a, you know how you get a call beforehand to remind you. Always a good thing, especially in my case. Well, when I got the call, one was in Bedford, one was Roanoke, and they were 15 minutes apart on the same day. So I had to decide what was more important. Basically, you know, when you get older, you say, well, what hurts me the most? So that, you know, do I, do I go to fix this or do I go to fix that or do I, uh, whatever I have to deal with. So uh, Liz and I just got out of chart to try to determine what was hurting the most and where I need to go to next. <laughs> But my friends, when God sent Jesus, it was the exact right time. Now, this is pretty amazing as you look at this. It was the right time religiously. The Jews were trying to keep the law and not doing very well at it. They knew that their Messiah was promised and they were ready. The Jews did not realize it was Jesus. Some did. But the law just wasn't working for them. The Gentiles was tired of the paganism and even a few of them were looking to the Jews for help. And I guess all in all the Jews are saying don't come to us for help because we, we're having a hard time in this also. Synagogues were popping up, and if you know, if you study Paul's ministry, and when he goes around and talks to uh, different places in different cities, he always goes to the synagogues. Why? There was primary Jew, uh, Jewish people, but there were some com converts from, from the Gentiles into Judaism. So he would go there to teach, and then he would spread out the word. Because almost consistently he was rejected in the synagogues. The time was right religiously. It was also the time was right culturally. Alexander the Great and his Hellenistic movement of the Greek, the Greek culture was moving rapidly. The Greek, uh, the Jewish Sadducees welcome this Greek influence. So what was happening in the area, the, the language of Greek and the Greek way of doing things was making its way throughout the area. In the same way now, if you go to a foreign country, oftentimes their sort of second language that is really coming strong, especially in the young, younger people, is English. And uh, I experienced that when I went on a missionary trip to uh, Korea. Uh, the older Koreans did not understand English. 
the younger uh, the younger people, when I talked in English, they all understood what I was saying. So I had an interpreter, and the younger people got what I just said. Interpreter had to interpret for the older people, and it, it seemed it was a little uh, perplexing to me. So the Greek language had made its way into the area, and um, it was also a peaceful time. The Roman Empire was in, in, was in charge. They were very, very strong. Nobody was dumb enough to mess with Rome. The, but one of the biggest things, the Roman Empire had built highways that connected all the major cities. Now, I hope you look at that and say, oh, man, God's hand. It was the right time because highways had been built to all the major cities. So when Jesus came, the gospel, the message, could be spread out in a much more powerful way because now there are highways to get to the big cities. And really, when you think about it, look at it, you go, wow, man, God's hand was in on, in on all ways. We knew that. We know that. But God's hand is in all I sometimes think when couples get together or relationships are built or something, how if you go back and you look and see the, all the events in someone's life, how God was working all out for this to come, come to be. And many of you would say, listen, the, the mate I have now, God brought them to me. But man, there was a long ways, right? Sometimes one goes out this way, one goes out this way, and then this happens, and then this happens, and this happens. Well, how did you get here? Well, where I moved down here from the past. You know, it's all these fascinating things. And I, when I hear believers getting together like that, I go, oh, man, do you see? God's hand is in it all. And though you may not be tickled to death with your job, God's hand was in on that. He may be preparing you for something else. But it brought you to where you're at. And it's amazing. And the highway was there. Did you know that the Romans built the first Studebaker? I'm just kidding. I just thought maybe I could wake you up on it. It was the right action. To redeem, verse 5, to redeem those under the law that he might receive adoption to worship. One of the things I enjoy watching, and I don't know about you guys, but as I get older, I get a little more emotional. I've always been somewhat of an emotional guy. I've just sort of kept my emotions under control. Not always, but I try to do that. And But when I watch those videos of a child that's being adopted by their foster family and they put a note in a basket or in a balloon or something and that child reads that letter that says you are now going to become our child. I tell you what, even, even in anticipation of it, just going around, I'm still going... Because the, the emotion of, I, I don't know what it would be to be in a foster home or to go to one foster parent to another foster parent. And, and some foster parents are really great. Some may not be that. And sometimes kids say, listen, the only reason they have me there is for the money that they got. And it was a terrible situation. And the joy that's on the family and the joy on that child is just, as I said, just blows my mind. For them to know that they are now officially their son or daughter with their new last name, it's legal now. It is permanent. In Galatians 4, 6, it says, because you are his son, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. One thing adoptive parents can do that uh, they provide a wonderful home, and most of them will say, 
Oh, it's my child. I don't, I don't, biological stuff, that, that doesn't matter. That's my child. And I've taken them as one of my own, and you, you know, you see them never, never know they're adopted because you, you shouldn't, because it's, it's, it's someone just take them into their family. But one thing they cannot do is to put inside them their DNA. And we understand that biologically, you can't do that. But my friends, when, when God adopts us as His sons and daughters, we get for lack of better words, is deep. We become like our Father. Yes, we are dead to the law, but we are adopted by God. Having the Spirit of God living in us, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes within you at that very moment and it's living with inside of you. You are Jesus's or God's one and the same daughter or son and you have his DNA inside of you. Have you seen it in others? I think so. I look around here and I see the DNA of Jesus within our church family. You ever do some things, you go, man, <laughs> that's not me, that's not my norm, but it's Jesus, right? And have you done this? Have you looked at others through the eyes of Jesus? I know you have, but looked at others through the eyes of Jesus, and maybe 10 years ago you would say, I don't have nothing to do with them. They're trash or whatever. I mean, I shouldn't say that hard, but <laughs> you look at them and say, that's someone that my father died for. And, and just like those tears of seeing an adopted child when I watch those videos, sometimes we can get a little teary-eyed, can't we, when we see someone hurting? We go, oh, I know what the answer is. <clears throat> and they need my father. They need to know that they're a son, they're a daughter, that they are loved unconditionally. Okay, but we had a question at the beginning, didn't we? Do we have the right to sin like Christ? So if the law's dead... We're saved by grace. We're forgiven because we're children of God. Does that mean, so what's the list of sins that are not forgiven? Well, if you're a child of God, you don't even have to worry about the, uh, worry about that. There are no sins that are not forgiven. If you're a child of God, you've already been washed in His blood. I have my card a thing that I use too often. I don't want to use it, but it happens. If I'm driving relatively fast, and it can be in the speed limit, but a car stops in front of me, and I happen to be looking at the trees on the side, my car will go beep, 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 beep. <coughs> and to put it Ever so gently for me. <laughs> Idiot, you gotta stop. <clears throat> I was looking at some other alarms. Did you know you can get a flying alarm clock that when it goes off? Now I don't know how many of you like to hit snooze. Liz and I have had this debate for years. Um, she's a snooze pusher. And I don't say I never do it, but as a general rule, when it goes off, I just get up. Because if not, I'm sitting there saying, I got eight minutes. It's probably been three, maybe I you. So I go back to sleep about 30 seconds before it goes off. <laughs> In her alarm clock, 
I'm not sure, but I don't think you can read snooze anymore because it's been. <laughs> but that's okay. We're different people. But you can get an alarm clock that sends out a little like drone thing that just flies out. The only way to reset it, it keeps going off, you have to go find it, get it, and put it back on the clock. That's pretty good, isn't it? There's also one called Clocky. And Clocky has wheels, and the alarm clock is on the ground. When it goes off, Clocky starts rolling. The only way to stop it and hit snooze is you got to go like, get clocky, pick him up, and bring him back and hit snooze again. The other is the only way to turn off your alarm, it's on a mat, so you have to get out of bed. When you stand on it, it turns the alarm off. And maybe one of my favorite is one that is called the target practice alarm clock. <coughs> when it comes on, if you can hit the uh, bullseye five times, your alarm will go off and you can snooze for another five minutes. These are things to warn you that it's time to get up. My friends, the Holy Spirit is our alarm clock, is our alarm system. And I find in people's lives that say, so I can sin like crazy? Yes, you can. There's no law that says what you can and can't do. But I guarantee you, if you have the Holy Spirit, you know. And very, very, very seldom, if any at all, in my years throughout being a minister and being a chaplain and doing different things like that, when people say, do you think it's all right? I have found they already know. Their alarm has told them that's not pleasing to God. It's not on a sheet of paper. It's not a law. It's in living for Jesus. And usually, in some cases, not all, when they say, well, what about this? They've used it already. Their alarm has already told them that's not pleasing to God. If I can get a little justification from the pastor, maybe I can go on. So the Holy Spirit is our alarm. Yes, it says the Holy Spirit is a comforter, and the Holy Spirit is a comforter, comforter but it also it can serve as a discomfort. When the alarm goes off. But the Holy Spirit also serves as the power to live for Jesus in this godless world. And folks, it's getting harder. And if you're trying to fight the battle to live pleasing to God in this godless world and in so many different areas that you can look, and I'm not going to go through a lot of your list of naming those. It seems like everywhere we turn, it's anti-God. And if you're a follower of God, you've got problems. Look at verse 6 when it says this, Abba. It's the Aramaic word used by Jesus. It was the most enduring word you can use for your father. A slave was not allowed to speak the word of the head of the household, speak the word Abba. Only the ones that could speak the emotional word was the son or daughter. Yesterday we had a birthday for our grandson Joshua, who will be turning five on Friday.
And there's the closest word I think we have to Abba today is Daddy. When your child says Daddy, that's a very emotional, deep word. Anybody, and I know this is not Father's Day, but anybody can be a father. But it takes a special person to be a daddy. for a son or daughter to refer to that as daddy. Now as they've gotten older now they most times say dad. But every once in a while and I think it's a blessing from God to me. Daddy. So emotional and I, and I said as I've gotten older I got more emotional but they don't realize that when they say that I just pause for a moment and I, and I just take it in. That in my humanness, I can so limited what I can do for them. But Liz and I, we would do as you would to you would do the world for them. Let me read in closing these verses from the message. It's basically. Galatians 4, 5 through 7. You can tell for sure that you are now fully adopted as his own children because God sent the spirit of his son into our lives crying out like this, Papa, Father, I may add the word, Daddy. Doesn't that privilege of intimate conversation with God make it plain that you are not a slave, slave wall, but a child. And if you are a child, you are also an heir with complete access to the inheritance of your Father in heaven. <coughs> now just pause for a moment and just let that saturate over. Just let me internalize it. Yes, we can sin like crazy. But we won't. We won't. Because of, well, my Christian liberty here, because of Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the law because it served a purpose, Lord. The law is what brought us to saving knowledge that we were sinners and that we needed a Savior. So, Father, the law serves multiple purposes. It is not to be thrown out. But Father, what the law could not do, grace does. We have an answer. And Lord, just thank you for your mercy, for your grace. And Father, with all due reverence, Thank you, Dad. In Jesus' name we do pray. I'll be standing at the front. We'll be singing softly and tenderly. If anybody has uh, would like to come forward, may God bless you during this time of invitation. Softly and tenderly. Please stand if you want to. Softly.